Good morning, welcome. Thanks for joining us at uh, M365 May. Uh, Matthew Gilbertson here, looking forward to talking to you for the next 50 minutes or so. And before I do start talking and getting into the presentation, I just want to say a quick thank you to the organisers of this uh, wonderful event. Uh, the content that I've managed to see so far is exceptional. Uh, I'm looking forward to catching up with the rest of it on a video later and digesting it. There's an awful lot to get through here uh, and it's really exciting that the guys have put this together. So that's uh, again, thank you to the organisers and uh, thank you to those of you who are joining me this Monday morning, uh, May the 4th. Um, let's get into it. We want to talk to you today about things that haven't changed since March 2020, but probably still need to be fixed. In IT, and I'm assuming that most of our people here are from some sort of IT or technology background, uh, we're very focused on what's next. We're always looking at the horizon here on the screen. You can see this beautiful desert road uh, that goes into the distance. And we're talking, and we have been talking for a number of years about our modern workplaces, uh, trying to find new and better ways of working. Uh, collaboration is a, bud, is a buzzword that we, we keep hearing all the time and, and people genuinely want to collaborate. Uh, they want to become more agile. Uh, we've talked about things like activity-based working, can that help us? What about AI and automation? And, and those are two topics that you'll hear an awful lot about during this conference and I'm looking forward to learning a lot more about them myself. But in my experience of uh, I love road trips and I love travelling and uh, I've driven down this road I won't tell you what speed I went down this road, but it was it was good fun. Uh, what I've found is if you want to get somewhere, you've got to start with where you are. So just for a few minutes, let's have a look at where we are technology wise. And I've got a picture here of the of the classic innovation adoption life cycle curve that we've all seen different versions of. But in the last sort of 20 years in technology, you know, our IT departments have gone from, well, here's your technology, you're going to use it this way. And they've transitioned uh, by and large, they've transitioned to this idea of, well, you know what, we're going to give you some more freedom. You can pick perhaps your own devices. Uh, we'll enable the apps that you want. Um, yep, OK, we're going to loosen the reins a little bit and, and give you some more of what you're asking for, a little less control. In conjunction with that, over the last 20 years in IT, we've slashed training budgets and departments. Very few uh, big companies have their own training departments anymore. And we've seen this explosion in the, in, in the consumerism of IT. Uh, what I do in my consumer life, I want to bring to work because I like that and we want to see that, uh, you know, why can't I use those tools at work? Why can't it be as easy as what I do at home? Yeah. But the question remains, you know, has this improved our productivity and has it improved our well-being in the workplace? And so to jump into that, perhaps let, let's talk about where are you at and where am I at? because we've never had more technology at our fingertips than what we do today. But the questions that we want to consider and I want you to uh, think about today, am I as productive as I really want to be? Do you feel like you're on top of your work-life balance? Would you like to get more done in less time? Would you like to do, be able to deliver more quality in less time? And this is a big one. Do I control my technology? Or does it control me? And how can I help myself and others achieve more? Is, is, that a, is that the place that you come from with your involvement in technology that you, that you love helping people achieve more? Well, that's great. Have you been able to help yourself do that? Because what, what I do with Tablet PC and the company I work with and that my brother and I, Brett, and you'll hear his session later in the month, what, what we've done in the last sort of 13 years is sat in front of groups of end users. And what struck us when we reviewed uh, content that we could present for, for an audience like yourselves is these five common workplace realities that we still see today. And I can tell you that these five statements I've heard in the last two weeks, each of these. So what are we talking about here? Because we've just established that, you know, we've got this new world of IT where we have more access to tools than ever before. But is it delivering a benefit to the group of people across our organisations? Because at the moment, we have situations where at least a third, at least a third of our audiences tell us that they are not tech people. One in three people readily put up their hand and say, technology is not for me. 
I don't find it to be intuitive, amazing, magical. I certainly find, don't find that it just works. I mustn't be a tech person. What sort of a workplace are you involved in if a third of your people, if a third of your people don't feel like the number one tool that, they're, that they need to use to get their work done, technology, is for them? Can we see a future anywhere where these people will need to learn to use or need to learn, need to use less technology? Probably not. Are we comfortable leaving at least a third of our people behind the technology adoption curve? Because that's where they sit right today. Uh, we hear this com comment a lot. You know, I know this thing, you know, computer, application, phone can probably do more, but, but how am I going to find the time to learn about that? Where can I go to to find the resources to help me do more of this? This is a very common thing that I've had personally happen in sessions. People preempt the session by going, oh, look, I know this could do a lot more than what I'm doing with it, but I'm very comfortable with what I'm doing right now. Again, are we comfortable leaving a large number of our people that far behind the technology curve? One, I suppose, of the most perplexing questions we still get a lot, and I heard it this week, in fact, is where is my data? Where is my data? And, and that question might be phrased differently as well. It might be questioned uh, like, um, can you please tell me the difference between OneDrive and SharePoint? Or if I store my files in Teams, are they somewhere else as well? Every, every group of end users I've been in front of has asked a version of that question, where is my data? Now for you and I who've been living in technology and speaking about technology and talking to people about technology, that might seem like a perplexing question. But that's the reality for the modern workplace. People are still asking that question. They also ask, how can I get organized? They have this sense of wanting to get more done and sort of understanding that reacting all the time to the next most important thing is not helping them. They would love to get out in front of their workload and plan, but they just can't find the time to do it. Perhaps my favorite type of question and the one that gets me uh, excited the most is when people tell me they want more collaboration. We have, I have my typo there, we want a more collaboration. What people actually say there is, we want a more collaborative approach to working together. Uh, now I find this quite interesting because I like to ask, what is collaboration to you? What does it actually mean to you? Because by definition, collaboration simply means working together. So when we ask for the ability to work more collabor collaboratively, we're actually asking for the ability to work more together. Does that question actually make sense? What specifically are we actually asking for? Because if we're in the same organization, we're already working together. So how can I have more working together? Are we actually asking for more effective working together? And what would that look like? Unfortunately, the reality is that this adoption curve that we keep talking about, and we talk about this first quadrant here with our early adopters, the rest of us, are this gap, there's actually a gap appearing in here, and the gap is growing in our experience. It's not being closed. And so let's just ask the question then, do we need to address the curve? Is it something that we need to tackle? Well, I say yes, we certainly do, because there are consequences that are being uh, studied and shown to us about this lack of adoption and the lack of control and the lack of engagement that people feel when it comes to the technology they're being asked to work with. In 2018, a study of more than 7,500 full-time workers in the US suggested that 23% of them say they feel burned out. And that means they feel stressed and exhausted, often or always. One quarter of the workforce coming to work already feeling stressed. Perhaps you live that. Perhaps you've gone to work feeling stressed before you even get there. I certainly felt a little bit stressed this morning before giving this presentation. But you know, is that your daily routine? Getting up, building up the stress levels and going to work? Well, for a quarter of our workforce, that's their lives. Stress. An additional 44%. So we're now over two thirds of our workforce feel burned out at least some of the time. And again, 
burned out means that they feel stressed and exhausted often or always, or at least some of the time. What's this result in? Well, it results in absenteeism. It results in job hopping and low satisfaction at work. It also sadly results in psychological and physical health problems. In fact, in 2017, a study done in the US suggested that the annual health cost of stress in the workplace was between 125 and $190 billion in healthcare costs being spent every year. What do you think the impact on that stress at work has been since March 2020? If before March 2020, when we went into lockdown and forced a great number of people to work remotely, something they'd never really experienced before, if that environment was at at least a quarter, if not two thirds, we're feeling stressed at least some of the time, what's that actually like today? Can we as organisations, as individuals and as society not address this technology problem? So let's move specifically into what actually needs fixing. We need to go back to basics. We need a beneficial technology skills foundation for all of us. And to be successful, it has to factor in human realities. So we'll consider some of these human realities uh, firstly, and then we're gonna come back and talk about how to solve them and, and how to build this beneficial technology skills foundation as I'm calling it here. The first reality we need to address is that the human brain is not built to multitask. Yet in every single job application and resume you read, multitasking is highly prized as a skill set. The reality is if I was to uh, illustrate my cognitive load and split it into various tasks, your brain does not process each of these tasks simultaneously. Instead, what it does is it quickly hops around them, quickly switching between these tasks, never letting you fully focus, never letting you get deeply into anything. You have effectively a divided mind and the way that the brain is energized and powered by the human body means that we simply don't produce enough energy to run these multiple threads effectively. What's the result of putting the human brain under this energy pressure by attempting to multitask? Well, you guessed it, the answer is raised stress levels. To illustrate this, perhaps you're a person that loves to use multiple web tabs and perhaps at the top of your browser, you've got loads and loads of web tabs. Perhaps you start out with one, but by lunchtime, you've maybe got 15 to 20 web tabs open in your browser. We can measure stress levels in the human body, cortisol levels. And what science is telling us is that as soon as I get to my fifth web tab, there is a notable, noticeable spike in my stress levels. Why would having multiple web tabs cause me to become more stressed? Well, pretty simply, the human brain through the eye sees all of this extra workload that you've got, sees these multiple threads and starts worrying, starts thinking about when can I get to this? How can I tackle this? I hope I don't lose this. I hope I can find it later. Maybe you've experienced that. Maybe you can recognize that, but that's the reality that our human brains are not built to multitask. There's another factor here that, uh, that we need to start talking about as well. And that's a number. Uh, that's not the number. This is the number. You'll have heard this in lots of presentations recently. Uh, Sachin Adela mentioned it in a presentation not so long ago. But scientific study done at the University uh, in, of California in the US suggested that task switching is hurting our ability to think deeply. In fact, it suggested that to recover from a distraction that you allow, um, will cost you 23 minutes and 17 seconds of recovery time. Yeah. The average information worker at present attempts to switch tasks every three minutes and five seconds. How much deep thinking is going on in the course of your workday? Checking notifications, chasing things, 
uh, continually allowing, allowing distraction and never allowing for the full recovery time. That's the reality that we need to address. So specifically, what still needs fixing? We need to understand that the human brain cannot effectively multitask, no matter what you may think, and that I'm much better off learning to focus more deeply on tasks. Another topic that we want to address is that we need to be we need to check our use of technology. So in conjunction with the distraction that the human mind struggles with that causes the stress, we are being conditioned, particularly through the use of our mobile phones, to continually check for distraction. In fact, the studies that are in distraction really highlight that we self disrupt a lot of the time. We are being conditioned to that through our use of technology. Social media platforms have been shown to manipulate even the way that they send through likes to you to give you a bigger hit in the chemical reactions you get to those things in your brain. So in other words, in fact, Instagram were proven to have done this, that they would hold back likes. You put a post up on Instagram and uh, you know, you're hoping that your friends will see it and like it. Well, they would hold back likes from you. They're collecting the likes and holding them back. Why? Well, they don't want to trickle feed those likes to you. They want to give you a big hit. They also want you to feel slightly disappointed at the beginning. So they'll hold back likes and then hit them all to you in, at one, in one bunch to get a bigger chemical reaction in your brain, to more permanently addict you to the use of your technology. So we really need to stop and think about our use of technology. And that comes back to that question I asked you to consider at the beginning of this session. Is my technology controlling me or am I controlling it? Because the behavior of most people today is that they have their mobile phones next to them in the bed. Uh, they might use it as an alarm clock and that's a good thing to do. But as soon as that alarm clock goes off, their behavior quickly escalates into checking notifications, quickly scrolling through emails, uh, Teams messages, um, chat, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, the list goes on and on and on. The feeding of that quick hit mentality does not let us get into the quality type of thinking that actually makes us feel good as humans. Chasing notifications is the ultimate enemy of personal and collective productivity. We really need to spend some time checking our use of technology and limiting the way that we let other people and other applications bombard our thinking. And this leads us to another thing that specifically needs to be fixed, and that's we need to understand that the human brain works differently when we use a pen than when we use a keyboard. Very simply illustrated, if this was my cognitive load, when I use a pen, my brain is flooded with activity, unlike any other tool that I use. Spatial parts of the brain, visual parts of the brain, hand-eye coordination and language skills are all being used when I use a pen. And interestingly, also when I see someone else using a pen. Pens help you focus and they help you pay attention. If you want proof of that, have a think about the way that governments deliver important technology messages. They'll put up a, an ad on TV and they will use a pen and a whiteboard animation to deliver a message. Why do whiteboard animations work? you pay attention to a pen. Now we need to understand this because in the technology world, we are very used to using keyboards. We sit at desks and in the IT space, if you work in IT, there's a very high probability that you're a great keyboard user. Even so, when you pick up a pen, you will think differently than you do at your keyboard. It's a human reality that the pen is more closely linked with creativity, with problem solving, with memory recall and retention, then you can possibly make a keyboard. So one of the things that we still need to fix is this understanding that for the majority of people, the pen is a significantly better creative and thinking tool than a keyboard is. Another thing we need to understand here from a, a things that need to be a fixed perspective is that tools can't solve problems. How many times have you seen a tool delivered to a group of people hoping that they will solve an issue for themselves? 
but the tool goes unused. We have low adoption and we have bad adoption. Um, you know, one of the common themes out of some of the sessions uh, so far is, is that technology poorly implemented leads to huge problems, uh, notification chasing, um, bad experience and low adoption. The data is telling us this. So we need to understand that solving tech problems, that fixing the technology curve and effectively bringing people that don't feel like that technology up to speed, helping them to get more done is not a tools problem. It's a skills problem. We need to address the skills gap and build skilled people so that we can solve, help them, uh, help them solve their problems and help them achieve more. And the next thing that we want to address from the things that need to be fixed is communication. Because communication is most effective when it's planned. Now with the advent of social media and platforms, particularly like Twitter, what we see is a rush to get the information out. People's internal thoughts that were once qualified, checked and then published are now put out immediately for the world to mull over. That behavior has evolved into our workplaces. We send a message first and we think second. Yeah. Now to illustrate that, I like to use a home circumstance and we've all, perhaps you've been guilty of this. I'm sure we're all guilty of this it's some, in some way. So I'm walking around the house on the weekend and I can't find my car keys. Yep. My first glance to the kitchen bench and where they normally live hasn't turned them up. So what do I do? I shout out to my wife. Hey, Andrea, have you seen my car keys? Now that question doesn't get a great response normally. It gets a, well, how would I know where you've put your car keys? Where did you last leave them? Have you had that experience? What would that question be like if it was rephrased? What if I'd said, hey, Andrea, have you seen my car keys? I've checked my office, I've checked the laundry bench, bench and I've checked the kitchen bench. I can't find them. What's the difference in those two questions? Well, the second question shows that I've done some work, that I've actually planned my communication. I've thought, I've done some work, I can't solve my problem, and now I've come to you for assistance. And the solution is, or, or the response is significantly better. It's, oh, okay, well, I'll check the bedroom. How about you check the garage where you were there, you because you were there earlier today. Planned communication is more effective. As a, you know, one of the sayings that we hear a lot in communication, the biggest problem with communication is the myth that it happened, yeah, or the illusion that it happened. And that's very true of the modern workplace. The modern workplace is battling with between 10 and 15 different communication channels or tools that we give to our people to use. From email to Teams to Twitter to LinkedIn and uh, text messages and phone calls, everything in between. It's not possible for the average person to keep across those channels. You cannot channel surf 10 to 15 channels and have effective communication. You will have missed communication. Communication is most effective when it's planned. That means that as groups of people, we need to start talking about how we're going to communicate. So we need to fix specifically a number of things here if we're going to help people remove the stress from their workplaces and become more productive or achieve more. So how do we go about shortening the adoption curve? Well, before I get there, uh, if you're interested in joining our competition uh, for M365 May, uh, please scan the QR code now and you'll get into the uh, prize draw. I want you to think again about these things that we're going to fix. Then we're going to talk about the solution moving forward here. So hopefully you've got that uh, QR code. I'll give you another couple of seconds to get that out. We've identified that our workplaces are overly stressed. They were before March 2020, and they're certainly more so now. That we need to check our use of technology. And we need to stop and think about the way we have distraction or allow distraction to happen at work and the tools that we're giving to people to enable them to get more done. So let's move on to what does the solution look like? Well, firstly, device matters. The tools, even though tools don't solve problems, the tools we give people do actually matter. And the device that people use matters. 
Uh, the most productive people, those who achieve the most, are ones who have devices with digital pens. Why would that be the case? Why would I need a digital pen rather than a great keyboard? Well, one of the biggest duplication of effort tasks that we go through, one of the ways we force people to do things twice is by allowing them to use pen and paper. Now, we've been trying to get rid of paper in offices since the 1940s, and in 1975, we talked about the paperless office for the first time. We've not delivered a paperless office, and the reason is that people still go to a physical pen when they want to solve problems, remember something, and think deeply. It's inbuilt into them. If I can transition that person from using physical pen and paper to digital pen and paper and tools like Microsoft OneNote, we're going to save them a great deal of time and give them a way to turn their quality ink based thinking into digital structured outcomes with much less duplication of effort. So if I want to help people achieve more, device absolutely matters. Knowledge matters as well. What do we mean by that? That's sort of a given, isn't it? People need to know stuff. Yes, they do. But the reality for our modern workplace is that people don't know what they don't know. And they don't have the time to find out this knowledge by themselves. The idea that self-learning is effective for the majority of people, that self-paced learning, that just-in-time learning is happening, is false. People are not doing this. They are defaulting to behaviours they've always had going about their days, feeling like they could get more done if only they had the time to find out how. Do you know, there isn't another sphere in life where we let this happen. Uh, no one else other than information workers is allowed to self-learn. Machinery operators, sports people, they are all put through training programs to make sure they know what they need to know before they loosen their jobs. Why is it for the, that for information workers, we just assume that people will find out the knowledge they want? Again, we don't make that assumption for someone who wants to use a power tool. Knowledge matters, and assuming that people have knowledge is the opposite of letting it matter. And to that extent, uh, or, or to continue on with that thought, practice also matters. Now, I want to tell you a quick story here, and this story relates to Kobe Bryant. So Kobe Bryant, one of the best basketball players to have ever lived, sadly lost his life last year. But I've always loved an article uh, that was written, um, and the guy's name just escapes me, Alan, his name was, uh, and I'll put the link up to this uh, later for you. But Alan went to interview Kobe Bryant at a basketball clinic that he established for high school students. So this interviewer had heard that Kobe Bryant had a tremendous work ethic and would practice his basketball craft a lot, an awful lot, and he wanted to go and witness this. So at four o'clock one morning, he got himself off to see Kobe Bryant and his personal basketball training session. He got there early, hoping to catch Kobe before he started, but uh, alas, he didn't beat Kobe. Kobe was already in a, in, a, in a heavy sweat by the time the reporter got there. Alan sat there for 45 minutes and was bored while Kobe Bryant did the same basketball wheels up and down the score that Alan did with his six-year-old son. Yeah. Over the course of the day, they had a conversation which culminated in this question at the end of the day. Kobe, why did you spend 45 minutes this morning doing the most boring, basic drills over and over and over again? And it's Kobe's response, which I keep carrying with me and I keep referring back to. His response was, well, I guess that's why I'm the best basketball player in the world. I never got tired of the basics. And that's a trap for us in information technology. Because our focus is on the next, we keep thinking about what is next. We've mastered the basics. Have we? Well, if we have, great. But I really want us to think about that. Have I actually mastered the basics? And for the people that we work with, the reality is they have not. And even for our professional athletes, those that are, or anyone, musicians, athletes, presenters, anyone in the professional sphere practices the basics routinely. They go over them again and again and again. You can never tire of the basics if you want to be good, genuinely good at using technology. 
we have to we have to resist the push to focus on the next and make time for the basics. Practice matters, and that might be uh, deliberate practice. For example, I know that recently uh, Outlook changed where the search box is. It took me about three weeks to master that skill. I just kept getting frustrated trying to find search. I would look at the screen and not see it. And eventually after maybe a few seconds, I'd go, oh, that's right, it's shifted, it's at the top of the panel. It wasn't until I deliberately practiced that mechanism, I said to myself, this is silly, stop looking for it, practice it. I just deliberately went to search a few times over the course of a few minutes and reworked a basic workflow for me and I've not had a problem with it since. Do we deliberately practice the skills that we need to use technology? When something changes, do we deliberately practice the mechanisms to get me to that function? It makes a difference if we do. Focus matters. If I want to get more done, I need to cut out time for myself to achieve focus. Get in the zone. There's no escaping the fact that that requires time. Block out time for yourself. Do you understand the principle that the notifications you receive from others are about their priorities, not yours? When in the course of your working week do you set aside time for you to achieve your priorities? Block out time. Focus on the things that matter to you and get them done. What will be the result? The result will be that you will be happier. We feel great. We feel happy, productive, encouraged, enthusiastic. We feel fantastic when we achieve the things that we want to achieve, the priorities we've set for us. If you want to be happier at work, find more time to focus. Communication strategies also matter. We have to have a communication plan. We have to agree as groups of people on how we'll communicate. I know uh, Lorian's a big fan of the uh, collaboration agreement or the communication agreement or contract, and I am too. You know, that, that having a set of rules that we follow as a group of people in the way we'll communicate with others matters to what I can get done. We have to also be aware of what we call the performance preference paradox. It can derail us, not is, it can derail us. What do we mean by that? Well, even if we know all this stuff and are thinking about it, our preference for what I know rather than what I need to do will make me make, will, will, will actually allow me to make bad personal choices. We actually have to fight for productivity. It won't happen organically. You need to deliberately choose it. And that might mean that you need to break, you need to de deliberately choose to break away from your keyboard and adopt more digital pen use. Um, that when we give users choice on what device they prefer, we need to understand that they'll go to what they're comfortable with and familiar with rather than what they'll will elevate their productivity. That's the reality of the way the human mind works. We need to challenge the performance preference paradox. Otherwise, it will it will derail us. And, and bind us to this stress state of work that we're currently in. And so to help us do all this, we need to learn to squash the adoption curve. So instead of the curve looking like this, you know, it really needs to look like this. We've got to find a way to squash this curve. We've been talking about flattening the curve. Well, that's very difficult when it comes to technology and skills adoption. But what we can do is we can actually apply pressure to it and skill to it to squash it. Now, what's some examples that we can learn from to help us squash the curve? Well, before I get to that, I'm just going to finish off with when we look at the solution, there's two major things that we can immediately address. So just thinking about all of these things that matter, we need to start thinking about how each of these things can help me stop or reduce the duplication of effort and how they can help me avoid distraction at work. These two things are the major challenges that all of our workers, including ourselves, are facing. They all, all the problems I face fall into one of these two categories, duplication of effort or distraction at work. Let's apply the things that matter to fixing those two things. But who's responsible for this solution? And how do we go about it? Well, who's responsible is pretty straightforward. It's not the individual, it's the group. Organizations are responsible for their productivity. They're responsible for the skills that their staff are able to utilize. 
And whilst it's certainly true that we want engaged individuals, if the organisation that I'm in isn't taking responsibility for my productivity, then what incentive do I have as an individual to, to contribute towards that? We are all responsible for productivity and we need to elevate productivity to a group focus rather than just an individual one. So how do we go about that? Well, I think we can go about that by talking about sport. Because sporting teams regularly squash the adoption curve. They don't have more than 80% of their participants in a professional team not knowing what's going on, not having the individual skills to make a team contribution. How do sporting teams do this? How do they squash the curve? Well, for a start, they have coaching. Coaching is central to squashing the adoption curve. So coaching is different to training. It's also different to assessing. Training and assessing are tools of coaching. They're not the coaching themselves. So when we think about coaching our organizations towards less stress, less distraction at work and more and less duplication of effort, we need to have a clear plan. I've mentioned five P's here. I subscribe to the five P method, not the six P method, the five P method. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. If I don't have a clear plan on how I'm going to upskill my people to a to a technology basic level, it won't happen. If I want effective teams of people, we have to build a team first culture. That's a non negotiable. We can't let people say, well, oh, but I prefer to do this in a team first environment. Can you imagine that? That the players in our soccer team, our touch free team or our AFL team, they all go, yeah, that's great coach. I love that, but you know what? I just prefer to do this. I just prefer to do it this way. What's gonna be the result for that team if the individuals go about the plan in their own way? It'll be ineffective, no question. They will not achieve their team goal. One of the key things to help us achieve team first is the establishment of a common language. And this comes back to the collaboration contract. If we don't know what communication mediums we're going to use when, how we're going to communicate, if we don't teach people to communicate having thought first and communicated second, we will not have a common language. We will have miscommunication and we will have notification overload, communication overload, ineffective communication overload. Another key thing here that teams do really well is they start with and persist the basics. Now, I'm not a professional sports person by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I love sport and I still play a lot of touch footy. The picture I showed you before was of my men's uh, over 45 South Queensland touch uh, football team. We were fortunate enough to win the National Touch League uh, for our division over 45s, yes, old men, uh, in uh, March, March 15th, five days before uh, the lockdown. It was actually the weekend that the lockdown started. Um, our plan to win, so the team comes together, it gets together, it trains for about four months before that tournament. So talk about squashing the adoption curve, what's involved? Well, we get together a group of people. We start with and establish the basics. We have to make sure that the group of people has a basic level of proficiency before we can build a foundation before we can talk about our game plan. So we start with the basics and those basics were done at every single training session we attended. When you think about sports and training versus performing, what's the ratio? Yeah, yeah. which side here is the training versus the playing? Well, from a sport perspective, it's training over here and it's playing over here. Much less time is spent playing than actually training. Now, if we can integrate the playing and the training together, well, that's a great thing. And perhaps that's something that we can do at work, that we can bring training into our actual work. But the sad reality at the moment for work is that we're all playing at work and we do very, very little of this. We have to find a way to change that. We have to find ways to keep practicing the basics. Once we have established the basics, then we can start to build on that. By the way, what would be the computer? What would be the, the technology basics that we would need to persist with? Well, I'm going to tell you that those basics are that we need to have people that are proficient in using their platform. 
if the platform that you're using is Windows 10, they need to be familiar with it. They need to know how to do things like split screening, turning off notifications, finding things effectively, uh, using tools like TaskView. If you have not got people that know how to do those things, you do not have a foundation to build productive skills on. Start with and persist with the basics. Build a solid foundation before you progress and then progress. Train a lot. Now, here's the other thing that teams do effectively. And if they're good, they train individually and they train as groups. You cannot have a productive team without skilled individuals. Those individuals need to be working on their personal skills. And this involves also the deliberate practicing of technique, skills and teamwork. Deliberately practice your teamwork. When was the last time you actually practiced an effective meeting with a group of people? Yeah. Why not turn your meetings into a practice session for a couple of weeks? See how they go. Do one a month. Whatever your strategy is, is fine by me. But have you practiced with a group of people what teamwork looks like in meetings, outside of meetings? If you haven't, we have an opportunity to fix the stress levels, the distraction and the focus time of our of our group. And all effective teams have improvement built in. Yeah. Feedback through the coaching group, uh, one on ones with the coaching group, team sessions, you know, ways, multiple sources of feedback uh, to keep the improvement coming. Because this is the great thing about coaching. Coaching is about constant improvement and good coaches are adaptable. They move and they change and they're effective because of the levels of engagement that they have with groups of people that they're trying to, to help achieve a goal. So in a nutshell, if we took this sporting organization workflow and brought it to work, we're starting to build a framework that can deliver more effective teams. We could maybe even be called high performing teams. So what should be next for us? Well, I want to implore you to go back to computing basics. I want you to learn how to use Windows 10 and tools like Microsoft OneNote effectively. Never get tired of researching and thinking about those basics and applying them to your workflow. Asking the questions, can these help me reduce duplication of effort? Can these help me avoid distraction, achieve more focus? When you find out ways to do that, share it with others. Deliberately practice your changed workflows. Another way to help do this is to build why and how into our daily conversations. It's been my experience that at work, we often talk about what needs to be done by when, but the how and the why is often missing. Build those things into all of your conversations. Build these things, build this learning into your weekly, preferably daily schedules. What would your workday look like if you spent five minutes a day practicing a work skill, a basic Windows skill, something that you knew would help you if you just adopted it? What would that do to your morale, your stress levels and your personal productivity? And what would it do to you if you could help someone else in your team uh, find that? So there's a lot of information in 50 odd minutes we've gone through. Well, we've only been on the call for about 45 minutes. I just want to summarize a couple of key things for you. And just to do that, I just want to go back to what actually matters. Not oh, too far. Key messages for you to take away from this session. Your device matters. If you want to improve your productivity, get a device with a digital pen. I don't care what brand it is. I care that it's got a digital pen. Build knowledge about the basics of productivity, about the way the human works, right? And then apply that to your use of technology. Practice technology skills daily if possible. Build much more focus time into your working life, whether it be focus on learning, whether it be focus on getting things done, Build that focus. Build communication strategies that are effective for groups of people. Oh, but I prefer to communicate using this tool. It is not an effective way to deliver quality collaboration. Be aware 
of your propensity to go back to what you used to do and that you will fall back. Even when you've learned new skills, you will fall back to old habits. And even in a sporting sense, that's particularly true when stress is applied to a situation. You know, our teams, they build a skill set, they, they build a flow of play, but when put under pressure or something unexpected, the team can fall apart quickly and go back to old habits. That's something that needs to be worked on. Have I built my skills up to such a level that they will withstand stress? And we need to think about this adoption curve as we just can't let it continue. We cannot let two thirds of our workforce remain in a stressful state regularly and expect to have effective workplaces. We really have to address this basic skill level that's not being addressed currently. Too far. So I wanna thank you very much for your time uh, on that. I hope that I've given you something to think about. Um, I don't see any questions in the meeting chat. Uh, if you have questions, I gave you my email address earlier, uh, but you'll be able to reach out to me through uh, May365. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, connect with me on Twitter or uh, email me directly. I'd love to have a conversation with you about whether or not you felt that this was beneficial to what you want to think about from a technology perspective and ways in which you can think about removing this duplication of effort and distraction at work. Um, to finish off my part of the presentation, I do have to thank the sponsors that have put this together. Um, now, I've done some work with Lauren and Megan in the past. Uh, I just had a brief chat with Lauren beforehand uh, and I spoke to Rebecca on Friday. The work that our uh, organisers have done is incredible, uh, but without the sponsors, they wouldn't be able to do this. So thank you to the sponsors. Uh, they're all listed here on the screen. I really appreciate your support. I really appreciate the opportunity to have spoken to you this morning. I hope to connect with you personally, virtually or face to face one day. I want to thank you very much for your time and I want you to really enjoy the rest of this conference and I hope you learn lots from it. I'm certain that I will. Thank you very much for taking your Monday morning and spending it with me.